So please welcome now Ken Spangler, Executive Vice President of Global Operating Technology at FedEx. So first of all, we all know FedEx. FedEx visits all of us. Give us a metric of how much business you're doing. Approximately how many packages are you delivering? More than 10 million a day. 10 and, million a day. Yeah, if you think of peak season, which for the pandemic era was like two straight years, but you know, <laughs> you, you can basically double that or more in a peak season. All right, well, talking about peak season, it, it seemed like the pandemic was nonstop peak season for you. We all know FedEx, but during the pandemic, we really got to know FedEx because there was forced transfer, transformation with everyone getting everything at home. Tell us about some of the tech advances and innovations that you adopted very quickly during that challenging time. Well, clearly, you know, just like every business, in fact, Paul had a great growth story, you know, the ex unbelievable explosive growth of Home Depot, but we were very similar in many companies, even you know, here I'm sure we're the same way. You know, let me start with just a foundation. If you think of FedEx, we grew about $50 billion in the prior 20 years before the pandemic, and then grew 25 billion in two years. So it was just sudden explosive growth. Now, part of that was just like everybody, you know, scaling all the events that we were doing, including even having remote people work from home. But in FedEx, you know, so many of our frontline heroes, our team members were out on the road every day, in our hubs every day, in our stations every day. So scale was number one. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to massively scale. Our volume skyrocketed. Normally you can kind of, you know, hold your breath for four or five weeks of peak. But when you suddenly realize this was going to go on for years, that scale was intensive. The second thing is, you know, predictability and automation was really our friend because we suddenly had more volume, more than we could do with. So we expanded a lot of automation. Now, all different forms of automation, literally from you know, physical automation and material handling automation, all the way to process automation. So bookends and everything in between. And then really important for us was, and fortunately, you know, we have a very innovative culture. Our chairman is incredibly innovative. He's still our, our founder is still our chairman. But things like sensor-based technology, we had, uh, patented you know, many different advances through the years, but just right prior to the pandemic, we had released something we call SensorWare ID, uh, Bluetooth low energy sensors that were on certain very high, valuable package, high value packages, and we could see them real time and utilize that data in all forms of automation and intelligence, but the vaccine packages became the most important shipments we ever had. So we started the vaccine packages with sensors on every single packages. And in a sea of packages in our hubs, we could see every vaccine package and make sure it got perfect service. I want to point out that the pandemic uh, really proved some things that were reassuring for a lot of companies. Many of our companies survived better than they ever expected. But FedEx, especially when you deal with the vaccines, was a company that could not fail and could not stop and could not pause. Um, I want you to tell a little bit about the founding story because a lot of people don't realize that FedEx started a long time ago before we were talking about tech innovation and the fact that the founder is still there. If you could just quickly tell people, I know this started in an academic setting, a, a paper that people were thinking, ah, that could never happen. You want to get things overnight? No way. Well, our founder, Fred Smith, he's, uh, you know, again, he's still our chairman today. It's been my, it's been one of the great blessings of my career to get to work with Fred for decades. But literally, he wrote this paper when he was at Yale. Okay, he had been a pilot, charter pilot, had been a military pilot, a marine pilot. So he had seen that, you know, the movement of high value, especially early days of technology equipment, people were chartering planes all the time for individual pieces. So he wrote a paper about it at Yale and, and basically, I think, I think the actual grade was a C. A lot of people said he had a failure yeah, grade. Yeah, a lot of people C. said you can't. But it was basically, you know, this is unrealistic though. Well, he went on, started FedEx. So little commercial here for you. Yesterday started 50 days to 50. So 50 days from yesterday will be the 50th anniversary of FedEx, FedEx founding. But anyhow, the part that Janet's mentioning is, you know, it, it, he's, a, he's a true innovator. He's one of the great innovators of the last 100 years, and, and he continues to innovate to this day. But he had a very famous saying that is the information about the package is just as important as the package itself. So if you say it today, everybody says, no kidding, right? Except Fred said that in 1978. So in an era, in fact, in the early 80s, we were 
buying all the 800 megahertz spectrum we could. We were running our own private radio network so that the information about the package enabled our operations. So that's probably the most famous quote from Fred that relates to how important information is the fuel of automation and you know productivity, et cetera. And probably Fred never imagined, even though he had this great idea, how many packages you would be delivering today. That 10 million daily uh, package load is just incredible. Let's talk about the challenges of this very tough business. Getting things to people where they live, especially that last mile challenge. I know we've already been talking about it somewhat, but talk about how crucial innovation is at FedEx, and not just for different milestones, but nonstop. You talk about massive automation. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, in today and, you know, processing, we use terms like, you know, hyperscale and, you know, it's just been scale and scale of automation and resiliency and productivity have been at the heart of everything we do. So, you know, relentlessly innovating is definitely, and I've said it already, it was in our DNA. But when you talk of things like last mile and you think of the scale of the number of shipments, the number of homes, and trying to automate that, especially because we're a little bit unique and we, we, we're a very federated business. You know, we think of FedEx, you think of four big segments. FedEx Express, you know, it is the airline, the absolute positively anywhere in the world company. FedEx Ground, the massive e-commerce company. FedEx Freight, the largest less than truckload. Think palletized freight in North America. And then FedEx Logistics that handles everything from how you do brokerage and clearance and things all over the world. And so innovation in individual segments has always been our DNA. But we're in an era now that it's innovating for the enterprise, creating innovation horizontally. So, you know, you, you, know, you mentioned last mile, the scale and the automation, especially route optimization, traffic, weather, all those things, bringing the data together. Again, as I said, data is the fuel, right? And the fuel and applying all forms of automation and optimization to that is the biggest opportunity in front of us right now. So talking about the adoption of innovation, first of all, a lot of that innovation is grown and engendered within the company. Talk to us about this little company within your company focused on AI and data, the DataWorks Group. Well, in 2020, we, you know, obviously data and you know, all forms of it have been in our DNA, like I said, and then, you know, we, uh, we majored in it for sure for many years. Big data, when that became, we thought, oh yeah, we're a big data company. But we decided that we needed to go to another level and truly major in it. So we created an organization called FedEx DataWorks, inside of FedEx. And then in 2022, made it a separate subsidiary. Uh, run by an incredibly innovative and smart guy, uh, Sri Ram Krishnasamy, and and that group is focused on you know data around the enterprise, all forms of AI. In fact, when I talked about the vaccine before, in rapid fashion during the pandemic, when we were putting sensors on every package, they created something called FedEx Surround, so that we had visualization of every single package everywhere it is. When you looked at a hub that might be sorting one to two million packages that night, like our Memphis hub, our greatest hub, you could pick out visually and see every single package so that you made sure it got onto the proper airplane. Mm -hmm. So FedEx DataWorks is that company. It's, it's our way of taking it to another level. We continue to grow it, major in all forms of advanced automation and data. By the way, why did you make it separate? Is it so people wouldn't bother those people working on the ideas? No, it was really to make it an enterprise asset that, you know, as we are separate, you know, we are a federated business and we were very federated. We're working much more collaboratively across the enterprise. We wanted one organization that is an enabler of the entire enterprise, no matter where you're at in the world, what region of the world you're in, and no matter which of our companies you're in. So you were talking about these sensor chips, as you recall, he said they were first used to track vaccines, very crucial and important package that they go to the right place. These sensor chips are, are rather like Apple tiles. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Since you've been using them, not that long, has it reduced the number of packages that have gone astray? Well, absolutely. And, you know, the thing about millions and millions of packages, things can happen. If they do go astray, you can find them immediately. Mm -hmm. So you get them back on course. That's the, that's the key thing. But literally in a time when, you know, our services, we're very proud of our service. Our service has always been very high. But in our history, some of our lower service levels were all during the pandemic because we were flooded with volume and we were having labor challenges like everybody. But our vaccine packages were well over 99% service. So every vaccine package was getting where it was supposed to go on time. The difference was they had the sensors on them.
So that's the proof point of how much better the service was with them. When, from my vantage point looking at business, I like to remind people that we have more problems in part because we demand more. Before, when we used to go someplace and buy something, chances of it getting lost were not that high. We now demand for it to show up right at our front door. That is a difficult process. So about DataWorks, this group that's designing and implementing new automation, you said there's a distinction between the big eye and the small eye. What does that mean? Yeah, and, I, and I would say that's more of a broad category of innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, I have a group that reports directly to me called Operations Technology Innovation. That's where this sensorware, we have, you know, the small chips. We have also a very much more powerful uh, infrastructure independent thing called sensorware mobile. So we have all kind of technology. So I call that that's that's the big eye of innovation. It's their job. They major innovation. Small but mighty team. It's not like it's a massive team. Uh, you know, very strong engineers. Like the gentleman that reports to me and runs it is a Norwegian engineer who has innovated for us for many years. But then, really, everybody's job is innovation. And so that's what we call, you know, the big eye of innovation is the team focused on it. Small eye of innovation is it has to be in our DNA, as I've said a couple of times, and it has to be everybody's job. So it's a matter of how you, you know, bring it to fruition, how you bring it to market. Because you're tackling difficult problems, you need to throw resources at it both time and money. So my question, how do you know when to kill a project? Ah, it's, a, it's a great question. It's one of the things we've been focusing on most literally over the last couple of years. You know, we went more than five years ago, we went to a true enterprise business agility process. You know, true agile, kind of a safe, scaled agile framework, but in a, in a FedEx way. And we took many different demand portfolios all over regions around the world and different companies and consolidated down to 10 portfolios in the whole enterprise, actually five of them that are large. And we, we run like many do, we run 10 week PI, so we replan every 10 weeks. But one of the things that was all great, made us agile, we could start more, we could also start more of the right things or the wrong things, right? And so we created a value management framework. It's, and it's really in the last year, we really majored in it because it's under a program we call Drive. But really what it is, is you know, ideation and value have to be connected. So we measure value on everything, and we now work on the highest value items. But to your point, Janet, is it's also knowing when to kill things that really don't have value, or the world changes so rapidly. Sometimes it might have had value in the past, and things are more valuable, or that value isn't what you thought it would be. It's better than hanging on to it. So we've gotten much better at killing things. In the last year, we've, in this, this I don't know the exact number on top of my head here, but in the last year, we've probably stopped more things than we had in the prior mm -hmm. five or more years. And, but, you know, we're busier than ever. It's because we have the value management framework that says what we should focus on. Yeah, well, to novelists, they often say that you often have to kill your darlings, the things that you're emotionally attached to, but it won't end up being for the greater good. Okay, you have the project that you do find creates value, has a good return on investment, and is a good idea. But of course, it's going to be complex. So let's talk about the big question, the big challenge that everyone here has. How do you get the buy-in? The people at the top have probably given their okay, but the people on all other levels of employment are gonna be the ones that are using it, as we've heard in some of the other discussions. Some people can be resistant, like is this going to change my job? It's gonna take my job. Is it gonna make my job more difficult if I keep my job? So how, as a tech person, do you get the buy-in? So Janet, great question, and I'm actually gonna to get to a really simple answer, but let me start with, you know, very beginning when I mentioned value management framework, it's business and IT. So everything has to be, and it literally gets certified. And as it gets certified in the process, it's business and IT. So, you know, you have that buy-in, you have certified value, you have linkage there. But the really simple answer to this is, it's organizational change management. You know, so many of us pure technologists, people that, you know, innovate and apply technology, we get kind of infatuated with the technology, but we forget the most important part. And the most important part is how do you drive OCM? And so to us, it's we have to major in the organizational change management aspects. You know, sometimes, you know, and I, I, I'll tell you a mistake I made early in my career, you know, we were driving towards, you know, much more, uh, much higher levels of, of agility, right? And we decided we're creating four teams to figure out how we're gonna do it. People, all the new roles in that. Um, process team, people, process, architecture, and communications. We thought, just communicate. You know, we keep everybody aligned. We have a communication strategy. And early on, we realized, wow, that's not the right focus. It's about organizational change management. 
all principles of it, like in an ad car model example, that's more important than the communication strategy. We literally turned the fourth team into organizational change management, and everything we were struggling with accelerated. So then we started to learn that in everything we do, it has to be a major. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I was, a, you know, one thing that makes me unique in FedEx is at one time I've been the CIO of every one of the operating companies. And when I was the CIO of FedEx Ground, we actually put a group together, a dedicated group, their only role, they were an organizational change management group. And it just accelerated what we can deploy to, we have hundreds of facilities around the country in North America in the ground case. And we have massive automation, 160 buildings that are massively automated. And by having that OCM group, the battles we would face got so much easier. And that's when I started to realize how important it was. And we've continued to drive that through the enterprise. I want to point out again, think about it. This is a company that we all rely on. We all receive FedEx probably more than we even realize. This company was started as an impossible idea before there were mobile phones, email, the common use of GPS, MapQuest, ways like you had to get things different places. So this company was born and has survived and become successful because of innovation and automation. If I interrupt you, when yeah. I said earlier that you know the uh, information about the packages more than the package right. itself was 1978. Not only we have to you know buy our own you know radio spectrum to put out a network. We literally were hiring electrical engineers and mechanical engineers to build the first mobile computers. So before we could buy them publicly from the providers that everybody recognizes today, we were building our own all during the 80s. Again, mm -hmm. that's a typical Fred Smith, nothing is impossible. But the vision of the data is you know, decades ago and that's what's really been the fuel for us. We are down to our last three minutes. I want to ask you about a question to look forward because we always want to do that with all of these companies. Right now, what are your biggest challenges? Is it scaling to meet this unbelievable augmentation in demand? Is it the actual costs of doing this business, the air disruptions that we've seen, the workforce challenges? What right now is the biggest problem that you are dealing with? Well, you know, Definitely it's easy to say, and I think most business will say is today, it's a little bit of the slingshot effect of the pandemic. We slingshot so far ahead, five plus years ahead of what our trajectory would have been, and we had to add so much capability to run that. And now the world's normalizing, and the world's very different. You know, we see, you know, normally you see the, you know, movement of the different regions around the world, and you can kind of predict and see what's happening, and they've really whipsawed a lot the last 12 months. So costs are clearly one of the most important things for us, again, like many businesses. So, you know, once again, it's how do you drive a different level of efficiency, different level of costs mm -hmm. after coming off, you know, just two to three unbelievable years. And then at the heart of that is, you know, part of driving cost is cutting costs, but a lot more of it is providing massive productivity, massive automation, all forms of efficiency. So at the heart of it, again, technology and IT becomes, you know, we see demands that we've never seen, larger demands that we've ever seen, but they're focused on the right thing, value, and in a lot of cases now, value comes from reduced cost or higher productivity. So with the goal of reducing costs and uh, augmenting efficiency, the company's actually doing something. They're having a collaboration between FedEx Ground and FedEx Express Deliveries. Why? Well, during the pandemic, we changed. FedEx has always, uh, for, for more than a decade before, we had three strategic operating principles. You know, like everybody else, we have mission and purpose and everything, but strategic operating principles were we compete collectively. That means we're one, to, one FedEx to all of our customers. We operated independently, and then third, we managed collaboratively. We changed that, and it was, compete collectively was the same. Operate collaboratively. So now we're driving synergy horizontally across the companies, and it's innovate digitally is the third pillar. Well, those, you know, it's only six words and only four of the words, three of the four, six words changed, but that operate collaboratively, the two biggest by far, FedEx Express and FedEx Ground. So we use what we call last mile optimization. We optimize across both networks. We deliver things together. We put stations together today. So we're driving, you know, really a horizontal synergy that creates massive value that before ran in silos because there was a period in our growth, focus is how you won in a competitive landscape. You know, focus was needed. They needed to be independent. Now we need synergy and scale and productivity, so we're operating them horizontally. Ken Spangler, I regret to say that despite the fact that you and I are both not slow talkers, we have run out of time. 
So, Ken Spangler, yeah. I look forward Thank to you. introducing you back to another Thank panel. Thank you very much.